We need to be submitted in relationship. We need to be part of the local church. Um, we need to be seeking out His will in the Word and then asking for His peace to reign in our hearts. Um, we're talking about prayer and about finding God's will for your life. Yeah. And Sheila, I'm so glad that we get to talk about this because this is, these are two subjects that seem to elude people. We think about prayer. Sometimes we grow up in a house where prayers are said before dinner. Uh, Bless us, O Lord, for these thy gifts, which we are about to receive through Christ our Lord. Amen. Or, uh, you know, flippantly, rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub, yay God. And yet <laughs> prayer is something that Jesus did. He commands us to do. Um, how has your understanding of prayer grown over the years? Well, you're right. Mine started off, um, I was born in a little fishing town on the west coast of Scotland, and my grandfather would lead prayer after Sunday lunch, and it was always for what we're about to receive. May the Lord make us truly thankful. Truly. So I thought there were correct words, but as I've grown in my own faith, I realized that it's not about, in fact, John Bunyan said it better. He said, it's better to have a heart with no words than words with no heart. I think God listens Amen. to our heart. And that's what I've discovered. Prayer is this ongoing conversation with the one who knows us best and loves us most. Hmm. I, I love that. Um, what do you think are some of the, the reasons that people don't pray? I think one of the main reasons is if they've prayed before and God didn't seem to answer in a way mm. that they hoped he would. I remember having a discussion with a woman who said, you said two things on the platform tonight and they can't both be true. And I said, what did I say? And she said, you said that God is all powerful, sovereign, and God is love. And I said, I believe both of those. And she said, well, I've buried two sons. So you're gonna have to pick one. Mm. Either God is almighty and I've buried two sons so he's not loving, or he is loving and he would want to intervene but he wasn't powerful enough to do. And that, Kirk, to me, is the greatest challenge of faith, living with those two truths to be true and yet not always understanding the way that God works. Yeah. And, and, and that's a picture of what we see at the cross, isn't it? Yeah. We see an all-powerful God who has not only allowed but sent his son yeah. to suffer and die on the cross. But the result is salvation for the whole world. So maybe God knows something in all of this that we don't. Yeah. And, you know, I think... For me, the, th the greatest gift of prayer is knowing, A, that, I mean, when I wake up every morning, my, as soon as I'm aware of being wake, awake, I'll say, good morning, Lord. I don't know where you're going today, but wherever you're going, I am coming with you. And I see it as this adventure, not as this, it used to be on my to-do list. I was raised as a, you know, little Baptist Scottish girl and prayer was on my to-do list and my quiet time. Now it's on my who I am list. It's like mm. the thought that I get to talk to the one who's holding everything, no matter what the news said, the one who's holding everything in place, mm. the one who's in control and who wants to communicate with me, that just blows my mind. I gotta remember that. Taking prayer off my to-do list and putting it on, on my who I am list, that's great. Yeah. I, I love that. I think it was Charles Spurgeon who said, uh, and it's usually Charles Spurgeon who's usually, yeah, good, usually good chance. John Bunyan's good too. <laughs> but he's, he said something like, "When I cannot trace the hand of God, I can always trust His heart." Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the things about the life of Christ that is humbling to me, I have a hard time reading this passage, because Christ shows us how to pray when it's hardest to pray. Hmm. You know, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus doesn't pretend that the road ahead is going to be easy. He's fully God and he's fully man. And so he at literally sweats blood. It's a condition known as hemotohydrosis. And the other place it shows up today is when people are being walked to their execution. He was in absolute agony of soul. So what did he do? He processed his pain in the presence of his father. He didn't, he poured everything out. Mm. And to me, when you tell God the whole truth, you make space for grace. So often if we're going through a difficult situation, we almost pull back. No, if you're angry, tell God you're angry. If you're broken, tell God you're broken. And I, I have discovered, and you know what I learned at most? On the floor, night one in a psychiatric hospital, when I had come to the end of myself, and I actually wrote, in the back of my Bible that night, I never knew you lived so close to the floor. I'm used to praising God and His majesty as we should. But Psalm 34 said the Lord is close to the brokenhearted mm. and cares for those who have lost the, the will to live. Sheila, why do you think prayer is 
important to God? Why does he want prayer from his children so much? He knows what we're thinking and feeling and knows what we need. He's sovereign and all these things. Why, why does he make it such a big deal? I think it's a couple of things. I think one, it shows trust. It's like saying, I don't want to take a step today without you. No matter where I'm going, I'll, I'll pray every morning, God, give me eyes to see what I'm going to miss today. Mm. Give me ears to hear what, behind what somebody's saying to what's really going on in their heart. But you know what I find fascinating? Our son went to Texas A&M, and when we would go up and watch football games or visit him, we stayed in this one particular hotel because we loved the fragrance. You walk through the doors and it's this fragrance throughout the whole building. Do you know that God has chosen prayer as the fragrance for heaven? Mm. You read about it in Psalms and in Revelation that the angels hold these great giant bowls of incense before the Lord, and they're the prayers of his people. Mm. When I'm sick, I look for a prayer warrior. And we, we hear that phrase a lot. Um, boy, she's a prayer warrior, go talk to her. There was a movie that my friends, uh, the Kendricks made called War Room. And it was all about this, this woman who she would just go to battle in her mm -hmm. prayer closet with candles and notes on the walls and everything like that. Is that a real concept, a prayer warrior? What does it mean to be a prayer warrior today? Well, the funny thing is after that movie, my husband and I both thought we'd try that and we cleared out the closet. Me too, niece. yes. But when my candle set fire to the prayer <laughs> things on the wall, it was a disaster. I think God calls each one of us to, you know, to different places. I mean, I pray when, my, like my husband, he prays for our family when he takes our dogs for a walk at night. He walks around our, all our neighborhood and he lifts up our son, Christian, mm. and he prays for me. I have different type, types of prayer. Like the, I have a list of people that I'm praying intently for. And I will get down on my knees and I will beseech heaven on their behalf. But for me, most of the time, it's just talking mm. with my father, the one who's in control. What about when someone stops praying because they feel that God isn't hearing them? H how, how can you encourage someone to pray differently so that it, it, it awakens real faith? That's a great question because I did a survey one night on Facebook and I said, okay, when I say the word prayer, what comes to mind? And some of the answers were predictable, like I feel like I just repeat myself over and over or I get distracted. I'm halfway through praying and I think, right. did I defrost the chicken? But other things... Or were, I fall asleep. Yes, <laughs> fall asleep, yes. A holy nap. Yeah, but sometimes it's more than that. You think, is God really listening? Mm -hmm. But I promise you, you might not always receive the answer that makes sense to you, but God is always listening. God is for us and there's nothing that delights him. And you know, sometimes I take a chair and I sit it in the middle of our room. This is usually if my husband's out and I just sit in the presence of my father and I just sit there being aware that I'm loved. Mm. I don't always have words but I always have him. My wife in the morning takes our dogs out for a walk. And one of the things that she always does is she stands beside this big oak tree and she prays. And I just see her out there with her hands raised wow. and she's praying for our children. She's praying for mm -hmm. our um, health, our family, everything. And I find for me, what you said is, is like, maybe I don't have a chair sit in the middle of the room, but I like to just sit on a rock outside at night under a starry sky mm -hmm and just ponder the vastness of space and saying, God yeah. knows the name of that star out there. And to think that that tiny little speck of light really isn't tiny, it's bigger than our sun. That was. It just is that far away. And he can see me yeah. and he hears me. Yeah. And just to have a conversation yeah. with someone that powerful, yeah. that cares, that's life changing. And I've discovered a lifetime is not too long to pray. Sometimes we give up because we've been praying for a spouse or a child to come back to the faith. There was a, a, a man from way up in the north of Scotland. His name was Angus. And I used to go to our Tuesday prayer meeting every night in Scotland and Angus prayed for the salvation of his wife. And she would come to coffee mornings, but wouldn't come to church. And one day Angus took my brother and I up in his little plane all the way up to the Shetland Islands and took us to the church where he went as a, as a wee boy. Mm. And we were sitting there looking up at this beautiful stained glass window. And I said to Angus, Angus, does it ever bother you that God hasn't answered your prayer for your wife? And he was quiet for a few moments and they said, he's never failed me yet, lass. I don't think he'll start now. On the day of Angus's funeral, his wife, gave her life to Jesus. So a lifetime is don't give up, keep mm. praying, keep praying. A lifetime's not too long. That's right, that's right. What a beautiful story. 
God's not finished with any of us yet. He's yeah. not finished with our kids yet. He's no. not finished with our spouse yet. And that's, that's something to hang on to. Sheila, sometimes we think of prayer as uh, reciting a list of things that we're really hoping that God will do or at least consider. But you talk about prayer being a two-way conversation. Mm -hmm. How do I listen to someone when I can't hear a voice like I'm hearing yours right now? Yeah. And sometimes I've, I've, I'll be honest, I've been down on my knees and saying, God, just send me a text. Yeah. Here's my number. <laughs> just in the, right, or, or, or just, just how do you have a two-way conversation when you feel like you're not hearing anything? One of the great ways that I start, and I've done this, I started it during the pandemic because I found myself kind of spiraling again during the pandemic with depression. And I read something by Athanasius who, was, who wrote in the fourth century. And he said, whereas most of scripture speaks to us, the Psalms speak for us. So every mm -hmm. morning I read three Psalms out loud. I go out onto my balcony and I read three Psalms out loud because it's yes. so good for my ears to hear what my eyes are reading. And you'll yes. find if you're sad, you'll find yourself in the Psalms. If you're rejoicing, you'll find yourself in the Psalms. And then just sit in the beauty of that and allow the Spirit to, to minister to your heart. Sheila, you've also talked about the simplicity of a prayer that consists of just one word. Yes. That you don't have to go on and on with these lengthy soliloquies to impress God with the sincerity of your heart. Sometimes in the midst of your despair, you can just cry out the word Jesus. It's one of the most powerful prayers in the world. I went into, when my son was in lower school, I went into his classroom and, and taught just a little bit. But then I said, if you're in a tough place, you're, you're in the playground and somebody's bullying or something's happening, the most powerful prayer is, is Jesus. And I got so many letters from those children later on. One girl said, sometimes my mom and dad fight at night and I go to my bedroom and I get down on my knees and I simply pray, Jesus. Hmm. I couldn't help but notice the universal acceptance of prayer in that moment where that NFL player oh. dropped to the field and where others, like coaches on football fields, get on a knee to pray and get sued or get fired. When that happened, the, the, the announcers prayed, the nation was praying, the, 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 the players on both of the teams were praying. Yeah. And it was like, when the, when, when, you know, when the stakes are high and it gets down mm -hmm. to a matter of life and death for someone that we care about, prayer is, it just seems to be instinctive where we go. You could tell everyone was shaken. That's right. My husband and I were watching the game. I mean, it was just, everyone was shaken. But I love the fact that so often something that, not that that was the intention of the enemy, but so often something that could be destructive, that God will use even those. I think so many people were brought back into a place of understanding the, the weight of prayer and the power of prayer. And even the young football player himself, you know, was so moved by the fact that that was the first response. It was, let's pray. Yeah. When people perceive that prayer is required, uh, it, is, it is unstoppable. If right. you tried to stop that announcer and say, no, you can't pray. Remember, that, this group over here is going to come sue you. Everyone would have just pounced on that guy and said, yeah. that's insensitive of you. Of course he needs prayer. Yeah. We're going to heaven. Yeah. And we're drawn down on the, the power of the Almighty. Uh, don't you care about people? And what we need to understand, I think, Sheila, is that prayer is always required. I know. But we just don't always yeah. perceive it. No. It's always needed for our families, for our yeah. relationships, for our country, for our jobs, for everything. I am praying for a holy boldness and yes. courage to rise up amidst God's children. People are not going to, I mean, yeah, you'll get criticism. Yeah, you might get canceled. But, but there's something, our nation is dying for the lack of people who look like they're living. All right, Sheila, we've been talking about prayer. We're talking about listening to hear the voice of God. What are some ways that we can practically develop rhythms of prayer wherein we're not merely speaking, but also hearing from God? I have several things I do. I love to go downstairs in the morning. I let our two dogs out. I have a cup of coffee, my Bible, a notebook, and a pencil. 
And, um, and I also have my phone because I have a worship playlist. And what I love to do is I will begin with this worship playlist and just these songs that remind us of what is always true, no matter what might be true for a moment. Because some days mm -hmm. you've got bad news the day before, something's going on or something's coming up. And to listen to this worship playlist, then I'll, um, I'll read my three Psalms out loud. And you know, it's interesting with the Word of God, sometimes I'll start and the first Psalm, and I work the whole way through the Psalms, I don't just pick and choose. And Sundays, I don't feel it at first, you know, I'm reading it and I'm doing it in obedience. But by the time I'm second, third Psalm, because it's the power of the living Word of God, I mm. find my spirits just raising. Yeah. And then I'll sit for a while and I'll just, I'll write down things that spoke to me, maybe something I've never noticed in the Psalm before. Mm. And I'll ask the Lord, I have discovered, this is kind of funny, but being brought up as a Baptist, we loved Jesus, we loved the Father, and we weren't quite sure about the Holy Spirit. We, were, right. we knew he was part of the Trinity and we were very grateful. <laughs> then I was in seminary in London and I went to a more charismatic church where the Holy Spirit had been given the front seat. And so that was a new experience for me. But at this season in my life, the fatherhood of God, I mean, from five on, I never had a father. And the fatherhood of knowing that I, I have someone who always has my back. Someone, I mean, sometimes this will sound daft, but my husband's not with me and I'm going to something and I have to put on something nice. I'll literally stand in front of the mother and say, what do you think, Father? And I feel his smile on me. And Jesus, I, I love Jesus more now than I've ever done at any point in my life. I mean, what a savior. But the Holy Spirit is this comforter. And I mean, when I don't know what to do, I'll ask for wisdom. Yeah. You know, I'm walking out of a, a coffee shop and I see a woman sitting on the side of the road and I'm like, what should I do? And sometimes I feel the Holy Spirit say, sit down and talk. And I've done that. And other times, no, just move. But it's just this, the glory of the Trinity and the fact that, you know, I was brought up just as the poorest kid in our school. After my father's suicide, we lost our home, we lost our car, we lived in government provided housing. I was the only kid in class that got free school uniform, free meals. Mm. But I knew I'm part of heaven's royal family. I look like I'm in disguise at the moment, but <laughs> I'm actually a daughter of the King of Kings. And so that is just, it's just yeah. this huge feeling of, and I, I mean, you get this too. I get letters from people who are in prison and you know, terrible steps led them up to there. But suddenly in the solitude of a prison cell, with no television to distract or no news telling you things that are just partially true, you have this time to sit and realize, you know what? I'm actually one of the richest people on the planet mm. because all of heaven is watching over me. And I think that's what, what, what God wants from our prayers is not just sayings by rote, but a real pouring out of our heart yeah. to him. And then us being able to, to uh, download mm -hmm. the the grace, the compassion, the strength, the, the guidance and discernment of the Father and, and of the Son and yeah. of the Holy Spirit. And I love that you're talking to us about the Trinity. Uh, it made me think of my wife. I knew her as my girlfriend, but when I saw her as the mother of my children, yeah. there was a whole different aspect yeah. I never knew. How could I? Yeah. When I saw her that way, I thought, wow, there's so much more treasure here than I even Absolutely. understood. And if I understand the fatherhood of God, but I don't understand the Holy Spirit of God, then I'm missing out on something. So much. Let's talk about the will of God. You, you speak of different types of, will of wills of God, his prescriptive will and his permissive will, or his prescriptive will. Can you explain those two? I give my life to Christ at 11. But when I was 16 years old, I went to see a depiction of the life of Christ with a bunch of friends. And the crucifixion had such a profound impact on me. All my friends left and I couldn't leave. I sat there for probably 30 minutes, tears rolling down my face. And I remember saying that night, Lord, I am all in until it's all over. I mean, I, every day, my, I'm, I'm all in. And my prayer had always been, show me your perfect will. Mm. People write to me and say, how do I become an author? How do I become a singer? How do I get on TV? And I've never approached a book company. I've never written to a record company. I've never, it's just, Lord, show me today where I should go. And at the right moment, God has opened the right doors. But I think there's things that God allows us to do if there's certain things we want to do. And it doesn't mean that we've abandoned God, but we just think, you know, I really would, I would like to do this. I would, like I was, I, I was classically trained. 
So at the same time that I got my acceptance into seminary, I got my acceptance into the London Royal Academy of Operatic Art. And both, it was like laid out on a mm. platter. And, and I, I talked to the Lord and I felt the Lord say, choose. But I knew that going to seminary was in, was in tune with my heart's desire. I wanted from when I was young to teach the word of God to my sisters in Christ. I wanted to evangelize and I wanted to care for the poor. And that fit that plumb line. Whereas the other one, it would have been fun and there would have been nothing mm. wrong with it. But it just, there's nothing better than waking up every morning thinking, and you must do this because your program impacts so many people. This is what I was put on the planet for. I mean, the way you fight for God's truth and you think, this is why I'm here. And, and that's why we've got to have faith because I don't always know what I'm doing and I don't always know that what I'm doing is what God wants me to do. But I say, Lord, guide me, lead me. Yeah. I trust you and uh, let's, let's, let's go. And it's often in the rearview mirror that I look back and I go, that's oh, true. That, yes, that, that was that's that's so exactly true. where we should have been. But we're told in the Psalms, if you'll hear a voice behind you saying, no, this is the way. And that to me is why we become yeah. sensitive to the Holy Spirit. That rather than living in a noisy world where we just listen to TV and radio all the time, we're listening for the voice of the Spirit. My wife has uh, always reminded our children that God's will is a perfecting will, not a pandering will. Oh, I like that. And, and that's great, right? And it's essentially what we're talking about, that God his will is to perfect us in Christ Jesus. Yes. It's not to pander to me in my self-will and in my, my, my um, narcissism. He's there yeah, to make sure. me more like Jesus. I love that. Which means sometimes you're gonna take a cold plunge uh, into this situation or other times you're gonna get fired at and it's gonna require you to put up the shield of faith and mm -hmm. to develop the qualities that you lack. Yeah, and I think, of, I think of the life of Joseph. I've been studying that again on the book of Genesis. And what I find fascinating is Acts, I think it's maybe chapter 11, you hear this, and God was with him and delivered him from all his fears. 12 words, 13 years. You know, we think, well, if God's with me and delivers me, then it's all gonna happen like that. It took 13 years from when Joseph knew that God had given him a dream of what was to come. And the interesting thing, every bad turn, like being thrown into the cistern, being trafficked into Egypt, being thrown in prison, we read this, and the Lord was with him. Mm. That, that to me, when people say to me, how do I find the will of God? I'm like, it's not lost. Just wake up every day and say, Jesus, today I wanna follow you. We can look to the scriptures but sometimes we want specific direction. Lord, yeah. should I take this job? Right. Lord, is this the right person for me to commit my life to in marriage? Those are impactful decisions. Oh, yeah. And I would give anything to receive an email from heaven <laughs> on, on such significant yeah. moments. Mm -hmm. How do we discern God's will in those kinds of situations? I have a kind of a three-pronged approach. Okay. I mean, obviously prayer, and asking for the peace of God to reign in my heart. I think when we're about to make a decision and it's not the right thing, if we're really listening, there'll be a check, kind of like a check in our spirit. And then um, the word of God, does this line up with the, is there anything in what I want to do that doesn't line up with the world? And then the counsel of godly brothers and sisters. I have um, three women in my life, I call them my safe sisters. And we talk about everything, you know, we've made ourselves accountable to one another. And I think when you have that community, you know, God said it's not good for man to be alone. We need to be submitted in relationship. We need to be part of the local church. Um, we need to be seeking out his will in the word and then asking for his peace to reign in our hearts. Have you ever felt like um, you're, you want something so badly whether it's a job or it's a relationship, that your own desires are, are so loud that they're drowning out the voice of God. Um, mm -hmm. and, it, and so I wonder, is God loud enough to get through all of that? How do I silence my own wishes and desires? Essentially, how do I stop talking to myself about what I think I want so that mm -hmm. I can hear God tell me what 
he desires for me? That's a great question, Kurt. And honestly, I would say when I feel like I need to do something, yeah. I never do it. You know, like, like, okay, here's a job. Sheila, you're going to get paid a million dollars a year if you take this job. Uh, Lord, should I take this job <laughs> or not? I need to hear from you. Like, and you're going, wait a minute. Like, I, do I have to even pray about this? But we should. Yeah. Because some seemingly good decisions yeah. could actually be a tragedy. Yeah, because I don't want ever in life to react rather than respond. When I feel like I need to react, like I need to do this now, I always hit the stop. And then I, want, I wait yeah. till I know, and then I'm able to respond. And maybe you're supposed to have that million dollar job and do keep us in mind, should that happen. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, that imperative, that kind of sense of, because I think that's one of the things the enemy does. He tries to get us confused and stirred up. That's not the way the Lord works in our life. He is a God of peace.